Hello everyone, I'm Cai Yang Xu. I'm an MA student from Columbia University, the East Asian Languages and Cultures Department. Today I'm going to bring a presentation of Mahayana distinction by situating in the map of the Buddhist world in Republican and Cold War China from 1911 to 1970. I'm going to highlight the historical contingency and fluidity of this constructed category. It is a common academic practice to divide Buddhism into two schools, Mahayana and Theravada. So Mahayana Buddhism means the greater vehicle. It refers to northern Buddhist countries such as China, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. Um, those countries that practice Vajrayana such as Tibet, Mongolia, and Inner Mongolia usually also were subsumed under the category of Mahayana. Theravada as a term coined in 1907 replaces the denotation of Hinayana as the lesser vehicle because Hinayana has derogatory meaning. It used to refer to southern Buddhist countries such as Burma, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia. It's also known as Pali Buddhism or mainstream Buddhism. However, I will show that this division of Mahayana and Theravada as geographical distinction of nation states is a later development in Chinese history. I'm going to take Tai Xu's Panjiao system, Tana classification system, as a case study to illustrate the trajectory of Mahayana distinction in Republican China. Tai Xu is a renowned Buddhist reformer in Republican China and he champions humanistic Buddhism. In the 1920s, we see a transformation of Mahayana distinction in China. Before the 1920s, Mahayana distinction generally functioned as a value judgment in ancient China. So it was not associated with nation states in most of its occurrences. Mahayana refers to the greater vehicle and refers to those people who like to become a bodhisattva, a pusa. A bodhisattva is somebody who is able to attain enlightenment but delays doing so because of his compassion for the suffering in this world. As somebody who seeks after the Hinayana path, in contrast, pursues the smaller vehicle, that is, individual salvation, instead of universal salvation. In the 1920s, the Mahayana distinction became associated with differentiation of nation-states in China. It is under the influence of the May 4th movement, an intense period of nation-making. In 1929, we observe Tai Xu publish the article The Origin of Buddhist Teachings and Its New Movement. Under this article, the Mahayana and Theravada division were mapped onto nation states. According to Tai Xu, there are three centers of Buddhism. The first center is in Sri Lanka, Cambodia, and Thailand. According to Tai Xu, this center was limited to the particular Theravada sects Hinayana teachings incapable of incorporating all the Hinayana schools and noble Mahayana teachings. The second center is in China's Tibet, but according to Tai Xu, this center's Buddhism was adulterated with Tibetan nation's primitive bone magic. So Tibetan Buddhism, according to Tai Xu, is superstitious. The third center, of course, is Mahayana Buddhism. It is associated with China, Japan, Vietnam, and Korea. However, according to Tai Xu, Japanese, Vietnamese, and Korean Buddhism were only a tributary of Chinese Buddhism. For example, Japan does not have a culture, according to Tai Xu, and Japanese Buddhism have followed the steps of Western Christianity to secularize the entirety of Buddhism. It is China, however, that has preserved the essence of Mahayana Buddhism. According to Tai Xu, quote unquote, the most magnificent is Chinese people's unique national characteristics. This union between the Buddha Dharma and the mind uniquely associated with the Chinese national character is the essence of Buddhism, as well as the root of Chinese Buddhism. It is only in comparing and juxtaposing China with other Buddhist nations in the world that China can gain a legitimate status as the new nation state in the new world order. Aside from the association with nation states, we also observe Mahayana distinction deployed in various world mobilization campaigns. 
In the northern expedition to fight against the militias in the north, we observe a surge of writing that associated with Mahayana with those patriotic Buddhists who joined the war. On the other hand, Hinayana was used to refer to those people who refused to join the war, who insist that Buddhism ought to be apolitical. After the union of China with the triumph of the Northern Expedition, we observe a hiatus of Mahayana distinction from 1928 to 1936. This hiatus is associated with a lack of war, major war in mainland China. A search in the catalog database of Republican-era Buddhist journals, we saw no articles containing Mahayana and Hinayana in the title appeared between these nine years. In 1937, when Japan started whole-scale invasion of China, again, we see a sudden upsurge in writings that distinguish Hinayana from Mahayana in Chinese periodicals. As can be seen, the Mahayana distinction was employed in a series of nation-making projects in Republican China. In order to distinguish China from other nation-states, we need to see Mahayana distinguished from other Hinayana nations as well as countries such as Japan that quote-unquote practice the lesser form of Mahayana. The Mahayana distinction has a trajectory. It is not a fixed category. Its meaning shifted under different political projects. So before the 1920s, Mahayana generally functioned as an abstract value judgment. During the 1920s, under nation-making campaigns, Mahayana distinction functioned as a national distinction. From 1926 to 1935, during war mobilization discourses, Mahayana referred to those people who joined the war, whereas Hinayana referred to a political Buddhist who refused to be patriotic and join the army. During the Cold War, we observed the Mahayana distinction symbolized in opposed identities. Many Mahayana countries such as China, North Vietnam, North Korea, and Soviet Union belong to the communist side, whereas many Theravada countries such as Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Burma, and Thailand belong to the capitalist anti-communist camp. Whereas many Mahayana countries as communist countries are atheist and champion the ideal of political monks. And the Theravada countries were religious countries and champion the ideal of apolitical monks. Now let's look at the Mahayana distinction in Cold War from the communist side. In Maoist China, we observed an intense politicization of Mahayana. According to many articles published in Xiandai Fo Xue, the major Buddhist periodical in Maoist China, Mahayana Buddhism and communism were compatible with each other. According to Chen Mingshu, the president of the Chinese Buddhist Association, there existed a necessary connection between practicing Mahayana Buddhism and communism. Another way that Mahayana Buddhism was politicized was through the discourse of anti-U.S. imperialism propaganda. During the Korean War, according to Chen Mingshu, Mahayana Buddhism must fight against the U.S. imperialism that breaks world peace. For example, Zhe Xun Yue Khan published a comic uh, entitled Firmly Eliminate the Influence of Transcending Politics and Transcending the International World. This image opposed the common U.S. trope of Buddhism's otherworldliness, Chu Shi, with Mahayana's thisworldliness. In this comic, a man in the Buddhist robe stood on the same ground with the people. He was about to cut the life's robe of another man who represented the American imperialism, the Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam has text on him that reads, transcending politics and transcending the international world. Such phrases alluded to the passivity of Hinayana Buddhism, which was conventionally depicted as escaping from worldly affairs. On the one hand, the author seems to realize the U.S. propaganda in Southeast Asia to propagate an ideal image of Buddhism as apolitical. 
On the other hand, this monk wore Mahayana robe. As if, as a Mahayana Buddhism Buddhist, this person firmly rejects the U.S. propaganda to make Buddhist Buddhism apolitical. Now let's look at the Theravada side in the Cold War conflict. In the Cold War, many Theravada countries sided with the anti-communist, capitalist camp. The World Fellowship of Buddhists, for example, had long been dominated by Theravada countries in early Cold War. Despite the founding invasion to transcend politics to build a united Buddhist world, this organization was fully involved in Cold War conflicts in a divided world. It was partially founded by the Asia Foundation, which was backed up by CIA. In the 6th WFB conference, the only one of the only two conferences in which both Mahayana communist and Theravada anti-communist countries uh, convened, the Cold War conflict uh, revolved around two central issues. Firstly, on the issue of banning nuclear weapons, the Mahayana Communist bloc voted against the remaining 23 Theravada countries. Secondly, on the recognition of Taiwan as a regional, legitimate regional center, WFB rejected the Chinese quest to withdraw this recognition. WFB claimed that the, its recognition of a Buddhist region does not have any political influence. However, this allegedly apolitical stance was a political maneuver. The Chinese resolution was defeated 13 to 6 around the communist-anti-communist -communist dividing line. The other five countries siding with China were all communist Mahayana countries. From the Chinese side, Mahayana Buddhism and communism were compatible with each other. In contrast, for Theravada Buddhists, Theravada Buddhism is opposed to communism down to its root. In Theravada countries, we observe a deep politicization of Theravada Buddhism. For example, Sangara Kashiva and Kantapala. They are two Theravada monks deeply involved in WFB affairs. According to these two Theravada monks, the ideal of Buddhism should be wholeheartedly about transcending this world to attain Nirvana. Nirvana can only be gained after prolonged meditation. That is, doing meditation saves one from the corrupt influences of Mahayana communism. Taken together, the Mahayana distinction functions as political icons in Republican and Cold War China. We not only examine what the Mahayana distinction was, but also ask what works did the Mahayana distinction do. Before the 1920s, the Mahayana distinction functioned as abstract value judgment. In the 1920s, the Mahayana distinction transformed into a geographical distinction of nation states under nation making campaigns. In the Cold War, the Mahayana distinction symbolized the divided war world through the communism anti communism dividing line. In Cold War, the central issue around revolved around what Buddhism is and is not. Should the idea of Buddhism be political or apolitical? I argue that it is a modern phenomenon to have the discussion of whether Buddhists should participate in politics or not. It is only when politics and Buddhism were regarded as separate categories with distinct ontological status that people can begin to start a conversation about whether Buddhists ought to be political or apolitical.